Hi team, welcome to my session on Coffee with Prab. And today podcast, we're going to cover what is important for you to understand from CISSP Domain Five: Identity and Access Management. If you go by the percentage, it is very less. But if you really need to pass this exam, you need to have a very very good understanding of the Domain Five. You can say it is like a base now for CISSP. Now, when you're talking about identity and access management, it is start with what is subject what is object and let's say example i am a user i want to access a website so when i when i request so i am a subject website is the object when i enter my username and password website website verifying the username and password from the another server which is called database then web server become a subject and then it become a database become a object so object is always a passive entity subject is the active entity so you should know what is object subject and access then we talk about administration of controls so we have a different type of administration of access control we have uh, we implement the control we monitor the access control we modify we test we terminate as per the business objective then we talk about the approaches how you implement the access control so we have a three type of implementation of access control administration one is called centralized let's say example you have a office in us and you only have one office head office in us and from there you manage all the branches of different different countries and all that so everything access done from there so that is called centralized administration the biggest advantage of going for centralized is very strict controls and easy to manage governance second is called as the decentralized decentralized administration is you have a local branch offices and you have a local access control there and they manage their functions that is called decentralized hybrid is a combination of both because centralized has a one disadvantage it is called single point of failure because if head office access control is down everything is down in decentralized governance is a issue because each and every branch they will manage their own access that is why a lot of companies go for hybrid where centralized activities critical activities approvals need to know required from head office and whatever the local administrations like sharepoint access given by the local im team so you should know this now move ahead we going to discuss about identification authentication authorization it is very important for you to know the definitions so if i say identification is all about assertion of unique identity for a person or a system a starting point for all access control second is called as authentication verifying the identity of the user and authorization define the specific resource understand in this way like when you go to airport you say my name is prab and i'm traveling from delhi to chandigarh or, or sydney to melbourne so they will check your name in the list whether your passenger name in the list is there or not that is called identification second is called as authentication it mean okay i can see your name in the list but do we need to confirm is you know you are the same person who claimed to be so i will show my aadhar card passport national id something is a proof which can prove that i am the same person who claimed to be that is called authentication and then they give me a seat number 37 38 that is called authorization that's why we say identification provide uniqueness authentication provide validity of the identity and authorization provide control over the access level now we have a different type of identification methods but make sure whenever you issue the identity it must be unique it must be non descriptive it should not reveal your job descriptions and all that and it should have a secure issuance now here the exam point is who issue the id to the new joinee so it is issued by the hr one of the also automation of identification of asset we uses rfid so it is a technology which is automatically identify the asset when when it come under the radar of rfid but the biggest concern is called as a breach of privacy in cissp new syllabus they introduce a new topic called git just in time access it is one of the important foundation of zero trust architecture and as a security consultant you should know git okay so git is is basically has a two primary use case and both focus on provisioning access only when needed so git is identify is a way to reduce some of the insider threats and um, they they can be seen as a way to enforce a principle of least privilege what is the meaning is suppose i join as a system administrator now i want to perform some activities some better activities more than system so they will escalate my privilege for a particular time and after that particular time it will be revert back to my previous state so instead of creating a new account instead of creating a new account i will use my old account they will escalate my privilege of my current account for some time being and once it done it automatically revert back so by this way we simplify the administrations we managing the same user and all that so ultimate goal of jit is to improve the compliance and simplify the auditing then we have a next topic which is called as a different type of authentication so we have a something you know which is called password or pin something you have token or smart card something you are biometric 
if you get a question around which one is difficult to implement something you are because getting an acceptance on biometric is always a challenge but which is one of the weakest is something you know which is easy to interpret that is why single factor is always weaker and multi factor increase the trust level of authenticity so when you're talking about authentication factor something you have which is called ownership so we have a two type of a uh, token soft token hard token soft token mean a dedicated software that you have installed on the device which generating a value for you google authenticator and hard token is like a dedicated hardware device like rsa and all that which generating a token for you so both are prone to human error further we have a two type of application based authentication tokens so we have a hotp and totp the best example of to totp is basically called time based okay so totp is a time based which is called time based one time password and the best use case is google authenticator where every 30 second it generate a token and hotp is called as a hash mac based one time password and the best example is ub key y u b y key so you insert the ub key and you press you know there sensor is there which generate a value for you so that you should know now another authentication we have a, a stand startup authentication which is used for the financial transaction when you doing a critical transactions and all that you should know this startup authentication and then we have a biometric so in biometric it is very important for you to know we have a two type of errors type 1 and type 2 the type 1 is called frr false rejection rate and type 2 is called as a far false acceptance rate now what is the difference so when we say type 1 which is called frr false rejection rate where the authorized user rejected by the machine and type 2 error is false acceptance rate where unauthorized user falsely accepted by the machine and i will give you best example of that suppose you you come you going on the way to your office you reach office you try to place your fingers on the scanner and machine could not able to recognize even you are a employee of the company but machine could not able to recognize so this is called frr false rejection rate now someone tried to mimic your voice and tried to bypass the gate and all that so he is not authorized but he use your voice in access that is called false acceptance rate now how to remember is if you want to walk 1 km and 2 km which one is far 2 is far so type 2 is basically far now one thing you need to remember is if you increase the sensitivity of biometric you are increasing a F- frr i repeat if you increasing the sensitivity of the sensor you increasing the frr it mean it take more time to verify everything it is same like you know when you learn from mistake you take you think twice before trusting anyone right so when you increase the sensitivity of the sensor there is a increase of frr and if you decrease sensitivity of the sensor you increasing the far so you have to balance that and the point where they intersect that is the best optimum point called cer cross over error rate that's how we say the lower lower the cer the most accurate is the biometric system now biometric is two type one is called physiological and one is called behavioral physiological is fingerprint facial image hand geometry iris pattern retina scan and vascular pattern retina scan scan the blood vessel but the most accurate and acceptance is iris pattern on the other side behavioral basis signature dynamics keystroke dynamics and voice recognition so that's something you should know now coming back we going to discuss about sso single sign on okay so next thing is basically we talking about here is single sign on single sign on is very important topic because uh, it just it's just like a gmail you know you log in once and able to access the drives files folders and everything right so same like single sign on the biggest reason of introducing a single sign on is user convenience because if you taking example of traditional access if you want to access five servers you need to remember the password of five servers but now authenticate once and access all the resources And that is called single sign on and one of the solution of single sign on is kerberos always remember one thing kerberos is a implementation of sso and it has the three functions authentication authorization and auditing now in kerberos what happen is we have a one concept called as a principal which is a user who request the ticket ticket is just like a passport okay so you submit all your document to get a passport so here you get a tgt ticket granting ticket and that's something you get from authentication server so we have authentication server and tgs server ticket granting server both are the component of kdc key distribution center so you can say kdc is the first thing key distribution center under which we have authentication server and tgs now what you need to know is the process when users connecting authentication server provide the tgt based on a tgt you get a session ticket to access a particular file server so session ticket is just like a visa 
Now you need to also understand we have a two major type of attacks in the Kerberos. One is called golden ticket and one is called silver ticket. Silver ticket used to capture the NTLM hash of the service account and based on that he can access a particular session but golden ticket if attacker obtain you obtain the hash of the Kerberos service account they can create a ticket at you know with the active directory and all that and the, if the TGT is down KDC is down everything is basically down so that's something you need to understand I repeat again in golden ticket who attacker basically gain domain administrator access which can create a golden ticket which is a ticket granting ticket with the extensive privilege and long validity period silver ticket is like forging the existing service ticket and based on that access the particular thing and this entire attack is called as a Kerber roasting Kerber roasting and they use a tool called Mimikat so that's something you should know another important thing you need to understand is the federation so SSO is all about authenticating once within a one domain and access the resource within a one domain but in the federation we access within a one domain or oh sorry authenticate with one domain and access the resource of other domain and the best example of this you can use gmail to log into booking.com so gmail is a one domain you are a user belong to gmail but based on the credential you can able to access the uh, booking.com without creating any new account there and the, the one benefit which booking.com get is you don't need to create any account so there's no accountability of data breach and all that so in the federation one of the solution we use is saml now one thing you need to remember is in saml we have a service which exchange the authentication authorization data over the web with the help of http and what they use is called as a saml as a assertion so we have a three component one is called as a identity provider one is called service provider and third is called principal identity provider is just like you know your gmail you authenticate with gmail gmail will provide you assertion and service provider is a booking.com who will consume the assertion and based on that we provide the access so you should know who will generate the assertion who will consume the assertion and make sure entire transit the assertion must be secure but this is something we use in an enterprise now we're talking about the another one which is called as an api based access so when we have a two different applications peer-to-peer -peer, they want an authorization authentication we use oauth oauth deal with only authorization okay and layman example is when you when you uh, you know I don't know whether notice five seven years back you know um, we uh, you know Twitter will basically grant access to LinkedIn so whatever you post on Twitter it ought to get ought to get post on the LinkedIn or whatever you post on LinkedIn it ought to get post on the Twitter that's an example of OAuth which is deal with authorization then we introduce an open ID open ID deal with authentication it means I want to log into booking.com but I don't need to create an account so we'll use a Google credential and with the help of that we can able to open the profile in the uh, booking.com then we introduce a OAuth 2.0 which using open ID in the combination of both and do the authentication authorization so OAuth may use JWT as a format to access a token, uh, token but the specification does not mandate OIDC specifically utilizes JWT for its ID token which include claim about authentication event and other attributes so you need to know what kind of a token has been exchanged in open ID connect which is called as a OAuth 2.0 so open ID connect is an authentication layer using the OAuth 2.0 authorization framework and uh, by this it providing both information so for example we have an end user which is a resource owner can print services which is a client access to her protected photo stored on a photo sharing services which is a resource server so without sharing a username and password with the printing services so instead she authenticate directly with the server trusted by photo sharing services we can issue the printing service delegation a specific credential which is called access token and that is called as an assertion sorry that is called as a json web token jwt now jwt basically have a three main component you should know first is header which contain the type of token second is payload contain the claim of json object and third is called as a signature a string that verify the integrity of payload now next is called as a idas identity as a service which is sas in nature okay everything is hosted on the cloud the biggest reason of going for the idas is the uniformity and uh, consistency and uh, ease of access but disadvantage is that if the IDAS is down everything is down so you should know that next is important part is called as a access control so we have a different type of access control the first is called as a DAC and DAC stand for discretionary access control a controls are placed on the data by the owner of the data the one of the primary advantage is that user control so user has a better visibility and all that so advantage of DAC is based on a system is it primarily user centric second is called as the NDAC uh, NDAC is where the administrator control who can access who cannot it is more centralized in nature uniformity is there 
Third is called as a RBAC. Now, role-based access control, where the roles, based on our roles, we give access. Now, as a user, I add it to a particular backup administrator group. So automatically, he will get a backup administrator role. The biggest reason, reason of going for RBAC, now you need to understand here. See, if you talk about DAC, e individual user need to be added to the individual file. Now, just imagine if you have a 10,000 users and 10,000 user has to be added to the 1 million files, which is a create a concern. So instead of adding each and every 10,000 user, we are creating a four groups. Delhi group, Bangalore group, Sydney group, Melbourne group. And we can have n number of users, but by end of the day, we are adding to this four groups only. So it simplifies the user access administration. So biggest reason of going for the role-based access control is simplify the user administration and increase the turnover, which can be manageable. Now next is called as a role-based access control. In role-based access control, like firewall is the best example. In firewall, you create a rule, right? Source is any destination is this. Source port is any destination port is this. If condition match, the packet will be dropped so based on a rule we create so rule based access control are most commonly form of DAC which can be created by user also administrator also next is very very important is MAC mandatory access control they are the controls which is determined by the owner and system this system apply control based on a privilege so here you need to understand so we use the concept of clearance so a user should have a clearance to access a specific object so we don't create multiple rules we create three things, okay, top secret, secret, confidential, senior management, management, and professional. So, so we have labeled this data as a top secret. So anyone with the classification of senior management can able to access the data. So we only have a three clearance. So subject assign the clearance level and object assign the sensitivity level. This is the thing you need to remember. So we are using this mandatory access control in a high secure environment, in the government institutions and military organizations. So here the controls will be given based on a need to know and access. Next is called as a ABAC, Attribute Based Access Control. And the best example you can say as a Netflix. The best example, you can take an example of Netflix. In the Netflix, when you, cre when you create first time login, they will ask you about your name, your type, your nature of web series, movie, what you like, Hindi, English, Telugu. And then they create a profile for you. So it doesn't matter you log in, I log in, they will check the profile. Profile has a, your attributes. So they will evaluate your attribute, which is called user attributes. And then they match with the application engines. So they have a series of web series, movies and all that with the predefined attributes. So they match both attributes. Understood. And based on that, they will display the list of movies, web series. And that is called as a ABAC, attribute based access control. So here we have a four type of attribute, subject attribute that describe the user attempt to access like clearance, department, role, job, title. Then we have a contextual, contextual attribute, which is called environmental attribute that deal with time locations. Then third is called as action attributes that describe the actions being attempted, which is read, delete, view and approve. And last is called as an object attribute that describe the objects being accessed and all that. So if I'm a user, I'm a security guy, okay, security administrator. So when I'm trying to log in, they will check my attribute. The user belong to security. The context is the late night. Time is late night. Location is unknown. So it's okay because security will work 24 into 7 from anywhere. So based on this only, we give access. Next important thing, when we giving any kind of an access control, we follow three step process. One is called provisioning. Second is called review and third is called revocation. So at the stage of provisioning, we create a user, we issue the account during a review, we monitor when access is not required, we revoke the access. So by revocation, we can able to maintain the access scope creeping. So this is all from my side. Do let me know how do you find this podcast and do share your suggestion in the comment box, which help me to improve my podcast better. Thank you so much. Good day. Bye.